established in 2009, IndieMade.com is where artist websites are made easy. Create an artist website with beautiful modern website themes with a built-in store, image galleries, and much more, all rolled up into a tidy website package. It couldn't be easier. In one simple platform, IndieMade.com bundles everything an artist needs to make, market, and manage a creative website. IndieMade.com's platform was built by artists for artists. Creative work takes center stage on every IndieMade.com website. With IndieMade.com's easy website builder, which is designed for the non-tech savvy, you'll be able to sell your artwork online, get excellent technical support at affordable prices. Go to www.IndieMade.com where you can try a no-strings-attached 30-day trial. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about overrated and underrated artists. If you'd like to build up healthy studio habits, ArtProf has everything you need. We have tutorials, critiques, and professional development. So Jordan, why don't we start with you? Who's an overrated artist for you? I think Matisse is a bit overrated. Um, I <laughs> probably gonna get a lot of flack for this, but I've never really been attracted to his work. Um, you know, I know he uses a lot of blocks of color and stuff like that, but it almost feels like every painting I see feels somewhat incomplete like or that there's no form really involved and uh oh just wasn't didn't really do it for me so you know just didn't do it fair yeah claire what do you think about matisse nah, he's okay <laughs> he's fine <laughs> but to be honest the only thing that i truly respect him for is that when his health started to fail towards the end of his life, he stopped painting altogether because he just couldn't do it anymore. But he started doing these cut paper collages, which honestly, I think are a much better fit for the look of his paintings. Because you're right, Jordan, his paintings are really flat looking, which makes me think, dude, why weren't you doing collage to begin with? Why were you bothering with the painting? And so it really isn't until his final paper cut collages that I started to get excited about his work. How about you, Alex? Yeah, I, I'm kind of starting to realize that sometimes when artists get it too historical, where like they help to define a movement, that I view them more as historical figures than I do artists, if that makes sense. Like I'm like, oh, sure, he helped like pave the way, he helped like break free, like challenge stuff, yada, yada, yada. But now looking at it, it's like, yep, those are that's some that, those are some colors. Yep. Like it, you know, it just doesn't I don't think it wows me enough. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I wonder I also wonder like if I were around in the time he was painting, if I would have a different appreciation because he's also got to compete with all the modern artists we have that I really fall in love with and appreciate. But, you know, so I'll, I'll give them that. But at the same time, it's like uh, the brush strokes not really feeling it like he's, he's no sergeant to me you know or you know the the way he's paying texture it all feels the same it doesn't feel uh like i don't want to say like he's not trying but it doesn't feel like someone who uh is fully in love with their work at least not to me at least not to me so sorry matisse sorry buddy yeah I like well, that last one because i think when you take work out of the context the time period that it's made. Obviously, we're not in 19th century France. We don't really understand where these paintings live in terms of art history. But I think that great art has a timeless quality to it in which that people can gain something from the image regardless of what time period they're in. And not, not gaining anything from this lumpy female figure. Hmm. How about you, Alex? Yeah, it's all the little technical stuff that bugged me. Like in this one, it's like, wait, 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 that weird curve of the grass going around the butt. Is that just because you had a tangent that was there from the other part of the grass and you had to change the horizon so it wasn't a tangent? I think that's what he did. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, OK, you mix black to make that color darker. OK, you know, that's killing the value. The oh, all right. Have fun. <laughs> Well, we have some comments here. 
Christine says, I don't like Matisse's collages, but his paintings are pretty wonderful. I got to see them in person at the Baltimore Museum last week, and my opinion has changed. Well, Jordan, have you seen a Matisse painting in real life? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. If I did, it clearly wasn't that memorable. Uh, I've seen Albert Beardstein, I've seen Sargent, I've seen some other artists, but um, yeah, Matisse, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. I really don't remember because I kind of, this might be a genre of art that I just don't naturally appreciate the same way. So my mind just kind of automatically erases it whenever I walk past it. I know it sounds messed up, but that's kind of what happens. And you I just like him that much that it's just completely blocked from the memory. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Sometimes when we do these streams, we're talking about underrated artists. I struggle a lot, be, or, or overrated artists, I mean, because it's like, I don't really think about the artists that are overrated that much. So I have to like really go back in my head <laughs> a lot more. Um, so <laughs> I gotta say, I do like this one a lot. I like the red room. I like the textile patterns. Yeah. I don't know. Something, a way I can't quite put my finger on. I think it works perfectly for it. I don't know. I just feel like all his work is color, pattern, shapes. And it's like, can we get past that? I mean, the scenes are really not that deep. It's like, okay, I'm got some peaches here and I got a green stripe down my face. Isn't that revolutionary? And ew, hideous hat from the 1963, <laughs> lumpy woman. Like, it's not real. There's not a lot there content wise. What do you think about the content, Jordan? You, you know what it feels like to me? Well, I think I might have a problem. It feels like he painted all of them in the same night. Like he, like they all feel like they, the exact same thing to me, just different subject matter. And like, I don't see that much development skill level or anything like that. And that bugs me over a career that lasted for decades. As far as the content, I'm not, again, I'm not that interested. Um, I mean, okay, figure drawing pose, like, all right, it is what it is. I've seen hundreds of those. I've drawn hundreds of those. <laughs> um, so it's not really, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Masaki says, all the women he paints look very bored, which I know is a problem in older paintings in general, but very bored. I don't know. Peter Paul Rubens made them pretty freaking cool looking and all those like epic war scenes. I mean, this is like, la la la, I'm sitting in the grass. I, I mean, is there anything here, Alex? Am I missing something? <laughs> I just can't tell if this is... Um pure abstraction like from imagination or like based like loosely um and of course very loosely on a model because it would be funny of just like all right now head no no not behind your head that's too natural put it just right there right there <laughs> relax now just relax <laughs> it just doesn't seem right <laughs> All right, so your underrated artist, Alex, is Justin Gerard. Can you tell us about him? And tell us in the chat, who has heard of this artist? Because I didn't know about him until about five minutes ago. Yeah, he's, I love him. Um, he's, I struggled to say underrated because he is very successful in his field of fantasy illustration. Um, I say underrated though, because I think he should be a household name. Um, I love that he, his work has such a knowledge of color and not in a simple way of like, oh, this is blue and orange. They get really complex and really subtle in how the color works. And as dabbling in children's book illustration work, I love that his fantasy work is not high rendered serious images. I love how it has a sense of whimsy, a sense of cartoonishness, and he's not afraid to display his own personal style in it where I think it's so common to see, like he did do illustrations of Lord of the Rings and it's so common to see them. It's like, oh, they all must be very serious and grave, um, but they all still kind of look like cartoons, which I think is wonderful. Jordan, what do you think? You know, if I were a kid and I saw these on um, book covers, I would instantly want to get the book, like no questions asked. Um, I think everything Alex said is so true. Like, I love the colors, the compositions are great. And the the whimsy effect, the, the fantasy, the wanting to jump into this world, not knowing anything about it other than whatever's, you know, setting is on the cover. Um, I think that's a, it's a really tough job to do, but one that 
Justin Gerard does really well. And I'm, it's really sad that I'm just hearing about his name tonight for the first time. So Alex, I blame you for not introducing us to him. <laughs> <laughs> he, I honestly found him over, um, oh, a quick question from Ellie Fitzpatrick. Uh, he does do uh, oil and acrylic. Um, but I found him over the pandemic because he started doing sketchbooks of like monster of the week and he would just make monsters every week. And sometimes he would color them. Sometimes he'd leave them just sketches. And it was just pure creativity, like each and every one. Nothing felt derivative. All of it felt unique and distinctly him. Um, and yeah, I'm e each one of his pieces is just, yeah, like an enchanted world I want to hop into. I definitely think he has a lot of skill <laughs> and his compositions are pretty ambitious. I mean, he's somebody who's just packing his paintings with windmills in the background and dragons and a moon. And there's so much going on in the compositions, but I almost feel like that's a drawback in his work. I feel like his compositions for my taste, they're a little bit cluttered. And I don't know that I agree with you, Alex, about great colors. The color really that good here. It's just monochromatic blue. I think, oh, but that, on first glance, but then you look deeper and you see yellows and greens and purples and even some reds. Like, you know, that's why I'm impressed by it because it's not just monochromatic. It just makes you think it's monochromatic. Well, However, do like I do color, have- Jordan? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry say that again. What? Oh no, Jordan, you answer. Cause I was I, gonna just agree. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the color? Because the color actually changes quite a bit. For example, mm -hmm. this one is pretty diverse. This one's very monochromatic. This one's mostly oranges. And this one is like stark contrast. Mm -hmm. I think my favorites are this image and the other one with the dragons flying over. Um, I think he definitely excels when the colors need to be super saturated, um, especially this one I think is really cool. Like I just. I want to know what scene this is, and I want to see the storyline and all the purple, I guess, eyes. That's really amazing for me. Um, and I do think that when it's a more neutral kind of line, just a regular day, like there's one where they're all fighting in front of the door, like that one doesn't really draw me in as much. Uh, it just feels kind of brownish gray. But the other ones, I know he has the ability to do it, but it might have just been, I don't know, restraints from the editor or whatever, who knows. Mm -hmm. I do I think, think I'm a little bit biased because here, here's the thing. Lord of the Rings is such a huge part of literature and movies and everything. And I feel bad saying this, Alex. I just like Alan Lee and John Howe's illustrations way more. But then I think maybe I like them more because they're the quintessential Lord of the Rings illustrators. And they did the ooh, hunting serious illustrations. I just don't like these. They feel very dopey, like seven dwarves. <laughs> like, I don't know. It doesn't work for me in terms of Lord of the Rings. Honestly, that's, I agree with you where my favorite Lord of the Rings illustrations are the very serious ones that look like they're from a thousand year old tome. And I'm like, oh, I love this. Like, yeah, if I was picking up a Lord of the Rings book, I'd be like, yeah, this does look a little too goofy. But I like, I love that there's that variety, you know? Like, I, I think I just resent when fantasy becomes as rigid as the reality it tries to escape, you know? It's like, no, Lord of the Rings must be serious. Like, <laughs> I like how he stretches that. Sophia says, it's the kind of art you look at for a long time because of the details. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is work. You got to spend time with this. This is not just a one-off situation. And I respect him for that. And he's obviously an incredibly skilled artist, but... It's hard when somebody illustrates such well-known stories that a lot of us have so many associations with. And I just have trouble with that. I'm sorry, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we have a super sticker from Christine. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> <laughs> now. It gets me every time. <laughs> Let's move on to my underrated artist, who is Mikio Watanabe. And he's a Japanese artist, but he lives and works in Paris. And I think his work is so elegant and sublime. 
And typically, I don't usually like work like that. Sometimes I feel that it's very sentimental. But what you need to know about this work is that they're created out of this intaglio printmaking technique called mesotints. So I showed you here, this is mesotints that I have made myself. And so it's a copper plate, which has been rocked. Basically, itty bitty little tiny holes are pecked into there. It takes forever and ever and ever to prepare the plate. You have to use a scraper and burnisher and you basically burnish out the highlights. So the actual plate itself is totally black and you have to scrape away to create the image. And then you have to ink it up. Mesotints are really hard to ink up. You have to put it on a press and then you end up with the finished image, which has this just beautiful softness to it that I've never seen in any other technique. Now that said though, mesotints are incredibly time consuming and Nikio Watanabe does all mesotint, which I cannot wrap my head around. Knowing <laughs> what you know now about mesotints, what's your take, Jordan? I think it's really cool. Uh, I never would have guessed that was the technique for this. I thought it was just like, uh, you know, a painting, like an oil painting or something. But I definitely see what you're saying about the softness of it. I definitely am sensing that with these images, and it creates this sort of ethereal fantasy kind of effect depend in regardless of the subject matter which i think is really cool what do you think alex i think it's one where 100 percent learning the medium makes me more impressed where i kind of would have just been like meh eye roll like because at first glance it looks like oh okay this is a fine charcoal drawing yeah you definitely understand value but okay but learning how much devotion goes into it like this is i'm blown away but if this was just like a charcoal drawing someone showed me, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> well, but does the difficulty of the technique excuse the image for you, Alex? Because yes, it's one thing to go, oh my gosh, she's doing this incredible technique, but ultimately it's the image that matters. And if I didn't tell you the media, Alex, would you still like mm. this work? This image here with the two wings, no. But the other ones, yes. <laughs> well, why do you not like this one? I think this one is just so, yeah, like it, I, I only like it technically. Like when you zoom in, I'm like, oh, well, that's amazing. That's absolutely breathtaking that you can do that. I quite love that one, the moths and the butterflies. But the wings, I think it's just, it looks like the cover of an Evanescence album, you know? Like, <laughs> oh, you're hurting me, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jordan, what's your take on the subject matter? Because the subject matter, it's not really that deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's better than Matisse's Naked Ladies, but... Yeah, that, that, yeah that goes without saying about Matisse. Uh, <laughs> but I I actually, I like his work, but I don't, I'm, I'm debating if I would like buy a book of this, you know? Like if, if I were to see this in the store and I would just art books, would I pay 20 bucks for, you know, 100 images of it? And I'm not so sure, but I can appreciate it. And if I were to see it up on a wall or in someone's house or the museum, I definitely would stop to look at it and probably even wonder, like, how did he do or how, how did he do this and all these different things. Um, I just it might just be a personal taste kind of thing. I'm not I don't think it's bad at all, though. Well, so Lee says I liked it even before you described the medium. Yeah, and the other thing, I know a lot of the times we just can't see the work in real life, but there is nothing like a mesotint in real life. First of all, they're usually very small because what it's called when you create the plate, it's called rocking the plate. And some plates that are like seven inches tall can take 20 hours to rock. That's if you rock them by hand. I'm super lazy. And I just bought pre-rocked plates and they're not nearly as nice as the hand rock plates, but I just can't rock a plate for 20 hours the way Mikio Watanabe can. And so it bums me out that none of you can see the work in person because it's just a totally different experience. I don't know, I guess maybe I'm overlooking the lack of depth in the subject matter because I'm a dorky printmaker and I just want printmakers to get the attention they deserve. <laughs> what do you think, Alex? I I think I understand what you're saying. And I do think that this is one of those works of art where I would be absolutely blown away if I saw this in a gallery or in a museum. This, These would be the pieces I would spend 
a good chunk of time just gazing at. Um, so I th and I it's I feel like it's such a cop out to say like oh you have to see it in person. I mean that's how I feel about Rothko, um, but I think that is a factor to it too. I think these are definitely more in that display form of art. Ginger Cell says, I agree. I feel like the average person wouldn't appreciate these. Why do you think that is, Jordan? Because I agree with that as well. I think the average person would be like, eh. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just the, I think we tend to appreciate work that has some sort of pizzazz, like some sort of like, oh, look at the popping saturated colors and look at this epic fantasy landscape, like that kind of stuff. Um, even like Albert Bierstadt, you know, his thing is all about atmosphere and how big the mountains are and you know, clouds and all that stuff. And this is more subdued and more, I don't want to say minimalistic, but it's very simple. And I think that it would be easy to kind of walk past something like that because of its simplicity. Well, work that's black and white or fairly monochromatic, even this image of the pumpkin is not really that bright, tends to not get a lot of attention. Also work that is small, that is fairly simple, that's not full of doors from Lord of the Rings, <laughs> tends to get a lot less attention. I mean, if you're not a printmaker, you probably would never know about this guy, unfortunately. And that just bums me out because printmakers, they're just always the underdogs. Like, why are the painters so popular? I mean, I'm sure they're fine. I'm sure they're making good work, but so are the printmakers and we just get no love. <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> it's like the art and, world is just the same debate that was happening in art schools of like, what are the printmaking students doing? Oh, no one really knows. <laughs> 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 They're just in the printmaking studio for hours and hours and hours at a time. <laughs> I, I would say that's accurate, having taught in the printmaking department at RISD. <laughs> well, Maria says, quietness is something that takes a mindset to appreciate. I love it, but I can't really mm. blame people who say they don't like it especially when you think about where people look at art people look at art on their phones now on their laptops and it's just not a common experience to go to an art gallery and i think work that doesn't come across well in a photo it just doesn't really impress people in the same way unlike drew struzan who <laughs> Alex pick for overrated artists tell us who he is and why you think he's overrated I think that was kind of the perfect segue of like something about quietness and the beauty of appreciating the subtlety in art. And that's like, boom. <laughs> um, so Drew, actually Clara and I had the same experience where it's like, oh, we didn't know their name off the top of our heads, but it was like Indiana Jones poster guy where Drew Struzan did all of the movie posters for like the eighties and nineties. Um, you know, Indiana Jones, Star Wars. I think his last big projects might have been, don't quote me on this, they might have been the Harry Potter movies, um, the early ones. Um, these are all done in uh, oil and uh, he uses pastel as well. And I think the reason I say overrated because I'm in no way, certainly not questioning his cultural impact, which is awesome, nor his technical ability, which is also awesome. I think that whether through his own artistic vision or for the direction of studios, it was pretty much just, hey, do that thing you do with photorealism and paintings and high contrast and color. Do that for decades. <laughs> so I think that's why I think it's a little overrated. Jordan, what do you think about his work? Uh, I actually really like Drew Struzan. I remember, um... I think I was a senior or a junior at RISD. I found a book of his in the library. I remember checking it out and just staring at it for a couple of weeks. Um, I've always really liked movie posters and especially his work because it, I, I couldn't figure out. I was like, is this a photo? Is this a drawing? Is this a painting? Like I was confused as a kid. Um, you know, one thing I, I do wish though is I wish there was more, you know, like action packed poses. Like it, it does feel like, you know, three or four heads and then. Uh, a vignette of something that happens in the movie, like, you know, the, you know, the spaceships flying and stuff like that. So I wish there was more experimentation, but in terms of his like technical ability and what he's doing, I actually always really liked it. Well, this is very interesting. There's a lot of comments here. Mosiki says, I always wondered how they got that quote movie poster look, hadn't realized they were painted. And also people are saying like Ginger Cell, 
I didn't know these were all the same person. I thought it was an art style. Well, that says two things to me. First of all, this guy's the dude that does <laughs> movie posters. I mean, he is the industry for movie posters. But I will say that time period has sort of passed. People aren't really making movie posters like this anymore. And I think for a lot of people, myself, Gen X and everything, this is our childhood. This is what we grew up with. And it feels very dated. I mean, he had a great run back then, but I think you're right that it's almost like there's a Drew Struzan kit. Here's your vignette, here's your main actor, couple flames, now let's put in the text and we've got our movie poster. So I don't know what to think because part of me thinks, dude, that's amazing that you were the industry, but it's also yeah. the same thing. There's something where, and I'm going to be honest, when I was looking for artists for this, I took five minutes to think of whether or not I wanted Drew Struzan to be overrated or underrated because of this image alone that he did for Pan's Labyrinth. And this image, not a lot of people have seen it, and it was rejected. It was shown mostly in the European audiences because it was, quote unquote, too artistic. And this image is breathtakingly beautiful. Like, especially if you've seen Pan's Labyrinth, this is so much better than the actual theatrical poster they made. And I feel like this one, even Drew Struzan was breaking his own mold. He wasn't just doing like pretty faces of the character in a setting. He was making this beautiful image displaying the story. And so I think he's very underrated when it comes to things like this. But I do think that maybe it wasn't his fault. Maybe it was just that he became the industry and everyone just wanted him to do the same thing over and again, which that's the part I think is overrated. Well, Jordan, what do you think about this Pan's Labyrinth poster? Do you think it feels like it's another category for this artist? Uh, I think I think so. It feels more like it's a specific moment in a story, whereas some of the other ones we looked at, they just feel like um, collages, if you will, like, you know, face in the background, moment in the movie, that kind of thing with the Pan's Labyrinth. It just feels like this is a specific moment in this specific film and wait till you see the movie and see how it plays out type of thing. Um, and I feel like that's got to be tough on someone who's had a career for, you know, 50, 60 years of, you know, people saying we want to we want you to do the old stuff. But whenever you break into something new, it's like, no, we don't want that anymore. We want, you know, we want <laughs> what you've been doing. And I can only imagine how tough that's got to be juggling those responsibilities and keeping everybody happy. And I feel bad for him that everybody knows these images, but nobody knows his name. I mean, when you put his stuff into the slideshow, Alex, I was like, oh, who is that? I mean, that sort of makes me really sad that your work could be that well known and so few people know your name. In fact, I'm wondering who in the chat here knew his name. I doubt that there were that many of you. So it, it's tricky because it's like you get famous for doing that one thing and then people just want you to do that over and over and over again. So I, I definitely have sympathy for him in that way. Okay, Jordan, this is your underrated artist, Sung Eun Kim. Tell us about his work. All right, so uh, Sung Kim, he's a South Korean artist. He is an animator, uh, illustrator, character designer, and storyboard artist. And he's worked on shows like Avatar, The Last Airbender, The Boondocks. And I think now he's an art director at Riot, I think. But I picked his work because I just adore his line work. I think he has this really great combination of characterizing or uh, doing caricatures of real people, but also like making them super dynamic and super fun. And he does it in a way that is unlike most other artists I've seen who try and replicate the same type of uh, style. Alex, had you heard about this artist before? Yeah, and it's one of those beautiful things of lovely sketches from an animator where you can see the movement in them. Like, he uses the whole body and the whole face to convey emotion and expression. And I just love that. Like, especially all those moments. I, I don't know, that kind of... <laughs> if I had to put a face with the, like, everything like that, where things are just so, like overdone in a beautiful, beautiful way. I absolutely love him. Seven Angelic says his work looks stellar. Did he do some of the League of Legends caricatures? 
Uh, yes, I think he did actually. Um, he he's done a ton of stuff. He did. Um, what was it? There's a movie called Think Like a Man with uh, Kevin Hart, and there's like a little animated action sequence at the very beginning. He also worked on that, and like he's he's all over the place. And like this image of Mike Tyson is just something he does for himself. And he has a I think he has a fascination fascination with fighters. So he'll do like Mike Tyson and Bruce Lee like all the time, or like Michael Jordan or. You know, something like that, but he always puts it has a foot in everything that I notice. Well, it's interesting that we just talked about Drew Struzan, who we said, oh, it's the same thing over and over again. This artist, I've never heard of him before. I mean, I knew about the boondocks, but I wasn't aware that he was involved with it. But the work is so diverse that it almost feels like it's from several different artists, which I have to respect because there's so much pressure on artists to find the one thing, that style that everybody likes, be consistent. And it's really refreshing to see somebody who's not doing that. I, I really respect that. I mean, Jordan, do you see that very often in concept art? Uh, yes and no. Um, no, uh, yes in that artists generally have to be style chameleons when they work in the industry because they have to abide by the style of the particular project they're working on. So if it's more cartoony, they have to tailor their work towards that. Um, but on the other hand, with Sun Kim, with he has his he has like two or three styles of his own, and that is something that is unique. I don't really see too many people trying to experiment and just putting stuff out there and just going like, all right, this is what this is all me. So I really love it for that for that reason. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I am very impressed with the facial expressions because people think that dramatic facial expressions are easy. They're not. It's really easy to make them look idiotic. And I feel like this artist, he retains the drama of the facial expression. And there certainly is distortion, him pushing the exaggeration. But they're all really specific facial expressions. It's not the same wide open mouth over and over again. It seems like everyone's very unique. What do you think, Alex? Absolutely. And there's a cool kind of thumbprint that you can see, like recognizing his work in Boondocks and then like a couple episodes in Avatar where like just how the characters are moving, you're like, I know who did that. <laughs> like, And it's like definitely... Actually, Jordan, question for you, because I, I, I think I could call you super fan. He didn't work on Legend of Korra, did he? I don't think so. Um, that was my guess, because, yeah, when I watched the first episode of Korra, I was like, there's something missing here. And it, it might have been some of these expressions, some of these movements that were all Sokka all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd have to like dig in to do more research on that, but... Yeah, I don't know if he was working on Korra, and if he w if he did, he might he might have done storyboarding. But um, yeah, I don't I don't think he did that much. If anything. Maria says, "I agree. There's a lot of pressure on artists to quote be a brand to make their quote business go well, and I feel like artists see their work as something else than just this is my nine to five, and I think that treating it that way can be a bit depressing." it's a really rough balance. I mean, Alex and Jordan, I'm sure both of you know about this, the, well, do I focus on the marketing, but I want to be creative, but if you're creative, it takes away from the marketing. And if you don't have marketing, nobody knows who you are. It's, it's like, ah, <laughs> 5,000 things to have to balance. And that struggle is real for many, many artists. Okay, my overrated artist is Spencer Tunick. Oh, he's so annoying. Just because you got hundreds of people to show up naked in a public space and then take a bunch of photos, I don't really think that's that great. I feel like it's just the spectacle, like the whoa, whoa, all these naked people. Like, why? 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 <laughs> What's your reaction to this? Um, I don't know how to react to this. I agree with you. I think it is a spectacle. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out like how do you even get this many people to be willing to do this? You know, like there's hundreds of just naked people. Like how do you how do you organize that? You just send out a mass email to the whole state or the country or whatever and just be like everyone show up at this time. <laughs> like it's just odd. It's really odd. It definitely feels unnecessary and I don't 
know what he's trying to do or say with this. So you have to wonder if the first time several times he tried to organize these if no one showed up because everyone thought no one else would show up you know like mm. <laughs> you know yeah like i don't know it's i think for me i'm a weird point where i think these images are cool um but in a sense of like let's call them coffee table book cool where it's like if you were like as you were like oh this is an artist and these are his artworks and it's a statement i'm like I don't know if it's that cool. Like, I, I, it's kind of fun, but it's, I don't know if it's all that. It seems like a cool performance piece more than a photograph. Let's put it that way. Well, so Ginger Cell says this seems clickbaity. I think that's what annoys me about it is it's that type of obsessive means of, oh, I took all these gummy bears and I arranged them as a rainbow and it took me 5,000 hours to do. And, it's just repetitive. And I guess you could argue, ooh, it's nudity and nudity is about intimacy, but look, it's public now. And I don't know. I just think it's kind of silly. In a weird way, Seven Angelic put perfectly why I think I actually like them, saying this stuff just creeps me out. There's a strange sardine quality to all the work. And I think that's kind of why I like it, because it kind of reverts us back to just the mass of humanity that we are. The billions of us you know and it just kind of puts us there i don't know but then i start going down all those really annoying cliches like oh we're all animals he's boiling us down to our primitive selves and <laughs> look at how we're all the same but different i, I just make <laughs> me want to <laughs> it, this feels like it, it, it took way too much effort for the result that he got you know like all of these people, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people reorganizing their lives and their daily schedules to go out and do these photo shoots to just be naked for, like, I, I don't see the purpose of this. Like, I don't know, I don't understand what was the inspiration for this, like him sitting by the fireplace going, you know, it'd be a great idea, get thousands of naked people and just take pictures from a distance and make them look like a wave of, you know, like waves. Like, I don't, I just don't, understand maybe that's just my limited understanding of his work but uh, yeah he's kind of in the same book as matisse for me right now <laughs> just to clarify because jane is asking so not done in 2020 <laughs> right no social distancing yeah this this was a long long time ago i doubt he's been working lately but i guess one of the questions that somebody was asking here Jane follows up by saying, yeah, I'm not sure what you even do with this. I mean, I guess you're right, Alex, you can make a pretty copy table book, but it's similar to the movie posters. It's the same thing, like all these naked people, oh, you're all doing the same pose, isn't that deep? Like, I, I just am not, I'm way more impressed by ballet dancers than I am by this. Like this just, ugh. it annoys me that he gets as much attention as he does. No, it's weird. I think I'm going to do my, <laughs> I'm flip floppy, but I think I'm going to push the button. This is my final answer. I think I would like his work a lot better if he wasn't a photographer, if all of this took place and like, sure, people could photograph it if they wanted, but if it was just a performance art piece, not meant to be preserved, if it was just like, all right, you thousands of people, everyone show up naked next to the Sydney opera house all of a sudden this afternoon and then go home. I think I would like that a lot better than these photographs. Would you, Jordan? I, I don't know. I think it's just weird for me either way. Uh, it, it, putting it like that, <laughs> not like a festival or like, a, you, know, you know, like a march or something like that, like the March of the Nudes or something. Yeah, like right? more like a weird, cool protest or like a statement or something yeah so i mean, i definitely think that could leave an impact but i don't know if that would make me like it more if that makes sense well crispy paintbrush says also most of the people in the piece in the piece are caucasian it doesn't show much diversity yeah what did he do was he like only white people can come that's kind of awkward when you think about it i have no idea i don't know what his <laughs> call for action is for these pieces, but that is a good point to bring up.
And Adam says, I thought the first one was sheep. Maybe Tunic is making a statement about the herding of the masses. Oh, God, that makes me <laughs> roll my eyes. <laughs> well, okay, dude, 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 listen, uh, Spencer, if you're watching this stream, know it would make this image so much better. All of them are naked people. One of them is a sheep. Just <laughs> one. And it's like a Where's Waldo thing. <laughs> that would be great. Now that I could get behind, Alex. That would be deep, don't you that, think? That would be an interesting <laughs> coffee table book right there. Like this image, just one of them's a sheep <laughs> just in the background. Ah. Well, we have several other underrated and overrated artist streams with lots of salty comments that all of you can check out. And remember, this Google slideshow is available and we have all of our slideshows on artprof.org. Sometimes they're really great for reviewing if you don't want to watch the entire video. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Jordan and Alex will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord in the post live streams channel so you can talk more about sheep and where's Waldo and all that fun stuff. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave us a comment. And a big shout out to our top Patreon supporters. You are the ones keeping us up and running, making it possible for all of our content to be 100% free. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.